it out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. everybody. This is George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Tom Fennell. Hello. Uh, Energy Week with George Harvey and Tom Fennell. Strange that we have those names. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, it's a real coincidence. Um, I get up early in the morning every day and look at the news and, and uh, keep track for, of what's going on for a blog, looking at energy news and news relating to global warming. And I spend about three hours every day gathering this stuff, which I use for, among other things, writing for Green Energy Times. But my blog, geoharvey.wordpress.com, I put up, um, oh, 10 to 15 links to news items every day that people go to to look at what's going on with the energy news. And there are a few people, anyway, who are interested in that. But it leaves me with a, with a, a gathering of news that I've decided to put together on a weekly basis, and Tom and I um, present that in this show. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to launch right in, unless you've got something going on, Tom? Not you? yet. Not yet, okay. Um, last Friday, the 13th, um, th the first news item is this, coming from hispanicbusiness.com. Uruguay's government said on Thursday, the day before, uh, the 12th of June, that 84% of its energy last year came from renewable resources. The small South, Afri South American country had been pushing for an energy diversification policy focused on developing wind and solar since, since 2008. That's really kind of remarkable, 84%. In a, I mean, they've got, as, as I understand it, almost no hydro resources in Uruguay. And I don't I know. They had hydro. I no, Par that was all they had. Paraguay. Paraguay. It's easy to. Why do I always confuse? <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> but it happens that I didn't confuse it this time because I was prepared. <laughs> ah, <laughs> I had right, watched this. Cheating. I was cheating. I looked it up. Um, Uruguay. You know, the capital of Uruguay is Montevideo, which is on the on the um, the uh, that. What is the river? The, the, I've forgotten the name of the river. It's a huge river. I want to say the Plata. But I Plata. Know. I think it is the Plata. Paraguay is upstream quite a ways from that and off the coast. Uh -huh. And Paraguay has huge, huge hydro resources. And it sells its hydropower to uh, Argentina and Brazil. And it has about a thousand percent of its own power needs met by hydro. Mm -hmm. So it's selling. Um, I think it's actually selling over, well over 90% of the power that it produces. So they put the power in a long time ago and they oh, yeah. make it Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uruguay, on the, uh, by contrast, has been developing resources. Um, and I don't know if they get hydropower from Paraguay or not, but they have been developing, according to this, solar and wind, and they're up to 84% renewable, which I think is impressive. So that came from hispanicbusiness.com. Uh, the next item, same day, Reuters told us that Germany's government has decided to stop issuing credit guarantees for exports of equipment used for nuclear power generation because the risks of, to public safety are too great, according to the uh, economy minister. And this puts me in mind of what was going on in India, where the Indian government, which was trying to push nuclear power in India, was insisting that the manufacturers of the, of the reactors bear liability in case of, f of failure. How can they do such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Why should we blame GM if people are dying? Um, you know, this is, we're back to the Price-Anderson thing. Um, the, in the United States, we have Price-Anderson, which guarantees, uh, um, uh, it's, a, it's a law which guarantees uh, liability of the nuclear industry will be f falling primarily on the U.S. government, the taxpayers, in the case of a, of a massive failure. It's basically insurance. It's insurance. Yeah. They get free you can't insurance. You get insurance from the insurance market. Yeah. So the government 
Yeah, you insurance. can't get insurance from the insurance market because they don't have enough money to cover it. <laughs> and you, if you think about the amount of money the insurance industry has, that's really quite a remarkable statement. But if you think about it, if you think about the fact that, for example, Vermont Yankee has more um, spent fuel in its spent fuel pool than all of the reactors at Fukushima did at the time of the Fukushima disaster. And you think about the fact that if that spent fuel pool had a problem that couldn't be dealt with, and, and for example, the zircaloy um, cladding on the fuel rods caught fire, mm -hmm. it, it would put out an amount of, of uh, nuclear junk into the air that would probably very much exceed what came from Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And the Fukushima disaster, 90% of the, of, the, of the radioactive material went off offshore and fell in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that and you just keep going with the implications of that, in a worst case scenario at Vermont Yankee, it would probably mean evacuation uh, for the foreseeable future, decades of Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, southern New Hampshire, probably southern Vermont, and possibly as far west as Albany. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. So um, how does an insurance company deal with that? It's off, off to the federal government. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, is, it, is it that socialism? <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> yeah, that's. No, that's not, that's not socialism. It isn't the government owning the means of production. It's the government guaranteeing the means of production. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. It's much how, different. It's much different. That's right. Yeah. I'm glad you straightened that I'm, out. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> if you can figure it out, please explain it to me. <laughs> okay, moving on. Next, next item from Marine Link. I love these sources. EPA Chief Gina McCarthy said on Thursday, again, that would be the 12th of, July, of June, that newly proposed rules to slash carbon emissions from U.S. plants will cut electric, uh, electricity bills after 2030 by forcing power plants to become more efficient. And I got news for you. I think she's wrong. I think it's going to cut electric. I think it's already cutting electric bills in some places. You know? I, told, I, I, I called my son about a year and a half ago, and I told him that I had found that an, an, an electric utility in a non-regulated area, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, to, be, to be clear, um, I called him and I said, you know, this non-regulated utility is offering 100% renewably sourced power at a price reduction. It's below price reduction. Price reduction. And I, I, I told this to my son, and he, he lives in Keene, New Hampshire, and he said, oh, that's not a surprise. I'm doing that already. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And he was getting it from his cable company. Okay. He was getting his electricity from his Through cable company. Through the cable company. company. So yeah. this is all being done by bookkeeping. Yeah, it's all being done. Obviously, <laughs> he's not getting his electricity through <laughs> to the cable coaxial things. cables that run into his computer. <laughs> but, yeah, it's all being done. By, and, you know, I have uh, my electric. This is my, my one luxury in life is the fact that, well, maybe one of two luxuries I have in life is the fact that um, uh, the other is, of course, that I eat. Um, <laughs> uh, is that uh, I get all my electricity from cow power and mm -hmm. pay extra for mm -hmm. that. All of it, 100%. Mm -hmm. I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. I get my electricity from cow power. Mm -hmm. And my heat last winter was under $200. So I, I think I have a small uh, uh, carbon footprint. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and you know, we're looking into uh, how to get rid of heating altogether. And that's something we should talk about. Getting rid of heat. Yeah, Getting rid of like, heating. Sounds like a good... It does. I was in a uh, house list last week, a uh, hay bale house. Yes. Aren't and they fun? She said something like she can heat the house by cooking, by, by boiling a pot of water. Yeah. I was basically <laughs> doing that last winter a lot of the time. And, of course, I had my thermostat set down lower than most people would be willing to set their thermostats. Yeah. But um, preventing really cold you know, from setting in pipes from freezing and things like that. All you have to do is cook mm -hmm. if you've got sufficient air sealing and sufficient mm -hmm. insulation. Mm 
And now they're talking about houses that, that meet a new standard, which is called the, the, um, the EPA has a standard, which is, they have a program called the um, Zero Energy Ready House. And the way that program, this is a big program too, mm -hmm. and the way that program works is that, you know, pe uh, uh, people in construction who want to be in the program go into the program and they have to demonstrate that they're actually producing houses that don't need power. Okay. And that, you're allowed to include in the power that you don't need, you know, it, 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 you're allowed to have power that you have in there from cooking and a certain amount from other sources. But basically what it means is that the house is, is heated by the body heat of mm -hmm. the inhabitants, by the dog, mm -hmm. by the, the tea kettle, by the, you know. And this kind of, this is a standard that's being developed right now, but it's very real and it's, and it's, it's happening. You know, it, it really is happening. In fact, today, I, I, I don't know if I included it in here. I didn't. There was a, there's an architect in Vermont named William McClay who just released a book on how to build houses of the, to this standard. To this standard. But, yep. you know, yep. I talked to a guy who was con uh, in construction in New Hampshire, um, a guy named Bob Irving, and uh, he, he t tells me that getting 90% of the way to that, which means you cut your heating bill by 90%, is not difficult mm -hmm. for the, for the mm -hmm. builder. And I've talked to people who have been doing that in terms of, of retrofitting houses. So this well, is... Uh, the concept been around, but people haven't been willing to do it. Yeah, but you build a house, it's, it's pretty cheap to insulate it. Yes. You're insulating it for R19, you can insulate it for R23 for almost no more money. Right. And you know, people just are, to pick numbers out People of are taking it to R60. Bob Irving said that um, the cost, this is something that he pointed out, the cost of making a house 90% independent of heat is equal to the cost of building the house without that specification. Is that so? Yeah, because you so, don't need so a furnace. Free. You don't, you need, don't a furnace. need a furnace. <laughs> ah. You give, you give some, you take some. Yeah. But, but the beauty of the thing is, not, you for spending the same amount of money, you don't have to buy the heat. You know, you, you don't, don't have, have to, to buy pay for the gas. You don't have to buy fuel, <laughs> and you can retrofit a house. Anyway, with that hopeful note, um, we should go to the fourteenth, which was last Saturday. And this is one of the most significant news items, I think, of the, of the year, if not the decade. And I really think this is a turning point. Elon Musk oh, okay. has made yet another highly interesting and somewhat unpredictable move announcement. And by the way, I, I don't know who did the proofreading on his announcement, but it could have been better. But the announcement itself is, in a long series of such moves, Tesla Motors will not initiate patent lawsuits against anyone who, in good faith, uses the company's technology. I got some good stuff on this. I'm going to start with a picture of a car being made in Tesla's factory. Oh, cool. Now, now it's very Look interesting that. about that. Very I colorful. don't see anybody in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, there are Luddites in the audience who would undoubtedly complain because jobs are being lost. But, of course, jobs are not being lost. That is a... Well, here's some more about... Well, this is about batteries. Batteries. Because what part of what Tesla's doing or part of what, what Elon's doing has to do with batteries. Yeah. And there will be more about that because I've got about four different Well, different there's a lot going here. on with batteries, and it comes from Elon Tesla Musk. has halved lithium-ion lithium battery costs in the last few years. Last four years. Yep. There's a lot of stuff here. And they expect to have them again in the next four years, which means that we're it's seeing a, lithium a battery decrease. I, I yeah. thought I had an article on, on him and his uh, patents, and I don't see it here, but uh, this is what I know we wanted to talk about. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's, we're ripe to talk about it yet or still talk about batteries. Well, we can talk about batteries. We could probably do a program on batteries. There's so much going on. Yeah, we could. Um, should we move on, Tom? Yeah, move on. Okay, move on. All right. Um, that, by the way, came from Clean Technica on the 14th. And you can find these things by going to my blog, geoharvey.wordpress.com, and look at the date, and you'll find a listing, and you can read the article. This also comes from Clean Technica. 
New York legislation would let people without their own roofs for solar panels invest in clean energy projects, which are more attractive than ever thanks to recent drops in the price of solar and wind power. Now that means that New York is basically following Vermont's lead on this particular mm -hmm. case because we've got these things where you can you can buy uh, you can buy a solar panel in a solar farm and it's yours, and the solar farm in many cases um, guarantees maintenance for 30 years or something and and uh, you can you can you can buy your solar panels and get your um, electricity from solar at a price which is the same as or even lower than the uh, price of electricity that you're paying now so this this is a movement that's spreading it is yeah uh, if you drive just north of Putney on route 5 yeah just like a mile outside of town, on the left, mm -hmm. there's a field of solar panels. Right. And I believe that's tied into exactly this. Yeah, there have been, there have been a number of different organizations that do this. Um, the, the one that I have talked about before is um, Sovereign Solar, which is in Putney. Okay, this one I think is, is Zyder. Uh, Nick Zyder. Nick Zyder's place. Yep, yep. is, is another one. Is Nick Zyder is a young guy who's come up with a business model that's a little different from from uh, uh, Peter Thorell. Peter Thorell is the man who runs Solar. Sovereign Solar. Yep. But there are, there are projects like this all over the state. And if you, are, if you are anywhere in Green Mountain Power territory, you can buy into any um, solar farm in many cases, I should say. So I live in an not, apartment in Brattleboro. You could buy I into. I can buy a panel yep. up, in, up in Putney. Yep, or in and, Rutland. Or in Rutland, yeah. yeah, and the power generated. My share of the power generated is credited is to your credited account. to my electric bill. And if the if the thing is designed properly, you can get a hundred percent of your electricity because you've you've gone to do that. You bought enough. You bought panels. enough to do that, and that is credited to your bill, and the the cost of doing that is lower than the cost or equal to the cost of your current bill. Mm -hmm. which means that as the cost of electricity goes up, your bill is, becomes lower than what it would be. Mm -hmm. And of course, if, if the cost of electricity goes down, you've signed into this, and it, it w winds up being marginally higher mm -hmm. than it would be. But, um, and in fact, Green Mountain Power has just announced that come, I think it's October, their bills are going to go down by 2%. Yeah, I read that. But um, nevertheless, what happens at the end of the of the of the buy down period is the uh, payback period is that you wind up owning your equipment you don't owe any money on it and the cost of the, the of the electricity is being applied to your bill so uh, the I, actually I should say the amount of electricity is being applied to your bill mm -hmm. so the cost unless your your unless your use of electricity has gone up the cost of electricity Ha, is now covered 100%, and the only thing that you've got to worry about in an electric bill is your connect fee. Mm -hmm. So you might be paying what is now $17 a month for all of the electricity. And if you've put in excess electricity in order to cover the cost, uh, the electrical uh, supply to a heat pump mm -hmm. or, um, you know, to supply your electric vehicle or whatever, you could, you could get to the point where all of your fuel and all of your electric uh, is free, basically. That's okay. what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And that, this is this is the ultimate in distributed power. Yes, and it, it is a it's a standard which I think will become more and more important. But in this particular case, we're talking about the state of New York being involved in in extending that kind of thing. Now to the next item, and this comes from the Washington Post. Ohio Governor John Kasich, Republican, by the way, for those who'd wonder, dashed the hopes of environmentalists leading, manuf leading manufacturers and renewable energy businesses Friday and signed a bill shelving requirements for utilities to ramp up to u uh, the use of renewable energy and energy efficiency. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This yeah. isn't going to last. <laughs> no, it's not going to last. Yeah, let's make sure everybody keeps buying oil, coal, <laughs> and stuff like that. That's what we're going to do. Who paid for this campaign? Well, I don't know the answer to that, but I can guess. <laughs> yeah, we can guess. It was a lot of people, and all of them already have a lot of money, I'm, I'm sure. 
because there are very few people who are going to benefit from this, except for people who owe lar own lo large amounts of fossil fuels. And on we go. Also on uh, Saturday the 14th, we find in the Berkshire Eagle, uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities has issued two orders that will allow Massachusetts to become the first state in the country that requires electric distribution companies to take affirmative steps to modernize the electric grid. That's an interesting one. Well, it is. I would expect they'd be doing that on their own, but well, uh, maybe yeah. they're lagging. I, you know, I, they haven't put a lot of money into that grid. They really need it. I think we've got another article coming up uh, about about the grid, and I don't remember. But you know, the, there is one that actually came out today, and it's not in this list. It's not in this list about the Hawaiian electric company um, having a having a PV system go up, and the PV system has to have. A smart grid connection so it does not feed power to the grid because the power company can't handle the yeah, power that it would feed in. I read that in. article. It's a, it's a mini smart grid. Yeah, it's a mini smart grid. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say about that except that it does mean that there's the technology to, to deal with the, the problems that the grid operators talk about with too much power it, being it exists. It exists. Yeah, it's 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 all computer computerized yeah. now. And I would think that it would it would be of interest to anybody who might find himself in the in the in the position of generating more power than the grid can use. It might be worthwhile to think in terms of what do you do with that power that you cannot now use that you could use to make money. And you know, I keep coming back to hydrogen. You can make well, that's hydrogen. That's certainly one of the ways to do it. Yeah. Any way you, anything you can do to store it. Yeah. Hydrogen doesn't and store well, but it, 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 there is a market for hydrogen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, you, could, you could use it to, if you store the hydrogen, then maybe you could, it would be, make sense to have, um, um, uh, what is a system that uses a membrane? You know, the, the hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen. Um, Fuel cell, fuel cell. Okay, that's, yeah, that's what's. Well, they're called. making a lot of a lot of progress there too. They are indeed. There. As a matter of fact, there was one that came across this morning. I believe it was on exactly that, mm -hmm. using a very very unusual uh, product to offset <laughs> global warming. <laughs> to to off offset catalysts. Oh, let, yeah. let me pull that. Oh one, yeah, I got well, a picture of that do we one. have this in this I list? Have, I have that one in here. Yeah. I, yeah, that was that was in yesterday's or today's, and I did save it because it was a very it's a beautiful article. Picture. <laughs> I should have put it in the list here. Well, you keep talking, and I'll find it. Okay. I know where it is. Yeah, and and that article that you're talking about, <laughs> comparing waste with platinum. Um, okay, um, uh, here that we was, go. Here okay, we, yeah, here you got we it. Go. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Uh-oh. <laughs> this is an invasion of privacy being shown on the screen. Fortunately, it's just a, it's just a, a, a drawing, a silhouette. Apparently, they use symbols like that in Korea. I don't know. Yeah, I human, human urine is a potent source of carbon catalysts. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> My goodness. Which could help power supercapacitors and batteries. Fuel cells, which are used for power generation in supercapacitors and batteries, usually employ platinum as an electrocatalyst to speed up their electrical processes. All right. We are, in fact, comparing platinum with urine here. Yeah. However, the <laughs> scarcity of platinum and its high cost have driven scientists to consider alternative electrocatalysts that are free of metals, such as carbon nanostructures. However, carbon nanostructures are highly specialized and difficult to synthesize. Scientists hope to develop, but they're just working on it. This is still a, what would you call it, a science experiment right now. Yeah, well. Hope, hope to develop simple and cost-effective synthesis methods that can eventually be industrialized. The team from Korea University's Department of Advanced Materials Chemistry performed a three-step process, dehydration, carbonization, and etching and washing. That sounds like four steps. Well, right? etching and washing is the same. To purify step. samples of urine, leading to a yield of porous urine carbon, 
which display catalytic strength comparable to the widely used platinum. So carbon that you get out of urine mm -hmm. through this process, which mm -hmm. is a very simple process, is as valuable as platinum. That's basically what they're saying. Folks, there. remember that <laughs> the next time you flush your toilet. <laughs> okay. Well, it's it's going to take a while, but some there there will inevitably come a time when we capture everything well, you know that, that we now throw out. Yeah, the, the, and this is just it, one it's of the just things one we more now lesson throw out. in that in that thing of waste is gold, you know. Mm -hmm. In this case it's waste is platinum, but you know, there it is. And we knew that we knew that uh, food waste and farm waste and all that stuff could be used to make uh, electricity. So here is a way that we could possibly use um, waste to make catalysts for making electricity or storing electricity. So on we go. Um, from the wicked local Wilmington, this is not Wilmington, Vermont, it's Wilmington, Massachusetts. <clears throat> as the use, and this on, on the 15th, um, as the use of solar energy has grown exponentially over the last decade, Massachusetts has become a national leader in the field. Massachusetts currently has 496 megawatts of solar energy capacity, up from less than one megawatt 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, I forget what, what the growth rate is that would do that, but it's, it's like 68% or 84% or something like that. I don't know the numbers, but I've been watching this. It it's, all seems to be concentrated in an area north and west of Boston. Okay. A bunch of little towns that seem to be okay. trying to beat each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I read that Harvard, Massachusetts. That's one of them. Yeah. Which ha, do, have you have you, do you are you familiar with Harvard? I've been there. Okay. I, I used to live in Groton, which, uh -huh. was, which is just two towns over from Harvard, and uh, Harvard, Massachusetts had like seventy five permits uh, applied for simultaneously, more or less. I mean, they had been applied for by different people over the course of a few months, but that was what people yeah. were doing to install um, install solar. And interestingly enough, if you if you follow this, if you if you can, if you could, um, you, you know, this is just the 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 mathematical. Uh, I don't know what you'd call it, but it's it's um, just doing the math for the fun of doing the math. Um, if you do that and you, you say what happens if that growth rate continues, mm -hmm. in less than 10 years what is, what is produced in Massachusetts would power the whole world several times over. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to what, ha what is produced in Massachusetts stays in Massachusetts. Now that, that can't be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it in the list here but there was one about a company in Massachusetts extending its, um, its its area of of interest into New Hampshire, and it was also for for installing solar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> New Hampshire is uh, an area where solar power has not been installed much um, in the past, and the solar industry there has a has a a, uh, a possibility of really taking off. <clears throat> as the price gets lower, more, oh, more yeah. people Absolutely. are going to look at it. Absolutely, and that's happening as we speak. Yes. Um, a new report conducted by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection shows that the state has made progre progress with greenhouse gas emissions. It is 5.4% below 1990 levels in the most recent test period, which was 2010, which is better than they had hoped for. They have a goal that they had to reach by <clears throat> 2015, and I think they, they may have reached that goal uh -huh. already. And that is from a... Uh, an organization called the Daily Voice. Uh, now on the 16th, and I'm losing track of what day of the week that would be, so I won't tell you. The latest round of UN climate talks concluded in Bonn yesterday with an upbeat note with a pledge that elements of a draft treaty aimed at curbing global warming will be circulated to the parties as early as the 15th of, of July, and that from Irish Times. So, you know, so, upbeat, okay, <laughs> let's keep going. A massive Chinese state-owned company has been given $25 million, and it doesn't say whether this is U.S. or Australian dollars, although the two are tolerably close in value, from the governments of Australia and the state of Victoria to develop more 
Latrobe Valley Brown Coal. Yeah. Good night. Yeah. yeah. Shanghai Electric is promising to build a $119 million demonstration plant to process coal into briquettes. I don't think those briquettes are going to be used in ba backyard barbecues. I don't think so. You know, <laughs> it, it, it amazes me what is going on in Australia. The, the, the idea that they are so tied into 19th century technology supporting early 20th century technology and they think this is the wave of the well, future. I, I think the answer is, is pretty pretty evident. They have a lot of these resources and these re resources are for the most part owned or controlled by powerful people. Yeah. And uh, they're looking at stranded resources, they're looking at stranded expenditures, stranded investments, and they're saying what are we going to do? So the answer is, let's get rid of it before the government forces us to not get rid of it. Well, I just don't see how they can how they can continue on this because they can't. the The Chinese government is cutting and the Chinese support are for starting coal. to wake up. And the Indian government is cutting support for coal. And other governments, you know, the United States is exporting coal. And I, I don't know. I feel very sad about those people in Australia. I feel sadder for the people in China because they're the ones who are living with the yeah, you, air pollution. We've seen the pictures of various yeah, cities yeah, in China, yeah. everybody walking around with masks on. Yeah, every once in a while I think about the, what I read about a seven-year-old child in China getting lung cancer of the type that is associated with smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And um, years ago, the tobacco industry was saying, oh no, that doesn't happen. <clears throat> cigarettes are not associated with cancer and they were concealing what they knew mm -hmm. which is why they got into trouble mm -hmm. now we've got the fossil fuel industry concealing what I believe it knows I can't argue that I'm sure they know and how can they not know yeah <laughs> <clears throat> anyway that's from a, a, a publication called the age on the 17th which I guess must have been Tuesday this is an interesting one. Lawrence Livermore's National Ignition Facility had its first fusion reaction that got more energy from the fuel uh, than I got, it absorbed. I got some, I got some and stuff. They aren't that. the first people ever to do this, but it is significant. <clears throat> the reaction, which was at 50 million degrees Celsius, yeah. you know, at 50 million degrees, there's not much difference between Celsius and Kelvin. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't I, I, I can't conceive of that kind of temperature. Yeah, um, <laughs> 50 just, for, just for those who who are interested, zero degrees Celsius is the temperature at which water freezes, and zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. Nothing moves. Nothing moves, and uh, at fifty million degrees, you can't tell the difference, and a pressure of hundred and fifty billion atmospheres. <clears throat> Again, I, I can't. Um, produced twice as much power a as was used to trigger it. <clears throat> this was from Scientific American. So obviously from yeah. Scientific American I, it must be true. I'll pull it up. I got something here on exactly that. On, on um, Lawrence Livermore. Lawrence Livermore, yeah. And basically this is just a science experiment. Yeah. This, this is just a science experiment. <laughs> but it's a good one. Yeah. Uh, the National Ignition, National Ignition Facility. This wasn't just a run-of-the-mill fusion reaction. It was the first one NIF has ever produced where the fuel released more energy than it absorbed. Yep. So they're making progress. The laboratory's got 192 lasers, which have been pumping energy into a succession of tiny fuel pellets since 2010. <laughs> In this instance, the scientists oh, got man. the t timing right. Instead of ramping up the lasers over the course of the blast, which lasts 20 trillionths of a second, that's a short period of time. It's a short period of time. Lawrence Livermore physicist Omar Hurricane that's an assumed name of whatever. <laughs> and his team started the blast at maximum intensity and then let it taper off. That change made the fuel into in the two millimeter pellet hotter sooner. 
reaching temperatures of about 50 million degrees Celsius and pressures of 150 billion Earth atmospheres. Wow. Such conditions enable fusion, and in this case, the fusing fuel yielded nearly twice as much energy as the roughly 10,000 joules that triggered it. Now, I don't know what 10,000 joules is. I can't you? conceive of it now. Okay. Uh, I've been working about and around joules, and I can't conceive. Yeah, you know that I can't conceive of a joule. One of the reasons I don't like a, ju a joule very much is that it it is it, it's a it's a unit of measure which is kind of outside the realm of what I can experience. Yeah, I'm with. But you. it seems to me that a joule is rather small, isn't it? I think it is. Yeah. I think it's quite small. Yeah. So this is closer than anyone's gotten before to self-sustaining energy. Yet scientists still have a lot of work to do. Although the fuel pellet yielded 17,000 joules of energy, the entire fusion experiment fell far short of breaking even. Yeah. So they're playing games here. Well, they're playing <laughs> games. But, you know, I'll tell you, if you don't mind a little story, what this reminds me of. And it, it involves the story of a kid who was, who was my ex-wife's brother, okay? And when he was in the, in the fourth grade, uh, he brought home a note from school which said that um, he, he, the note said, this boy is mildly retarded. Um, they used that word. In I think days. you've mentioned this guy. Yeah. yeah. This boy is mildly retarded and uh, needs to be in a special ed class. And his mother, who had complete contempt for, for school teachers, just ignored the, vote, the, the note. Well, he brought on home another note the next year. And that note said, I read the note from last year. Ignore it, please. This boy is not retarded. He's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I read an article in Time magazine that said, in fact, 50% of the kids in this country who have IQs above 140 f drop out of high school. Yeah, We're, we're losing yeah. some pretty interesting resources there. It's just not interesting enough for But them. what happened was he dropped out of high school. And he dropped out because he had a third grade reading level. And um, he argued with an English teacher who said, there's no way you're going to graduate, so we're going we're gonna, to, you know, you're, you're going to have to think about something else. So he got angry, and he dropped out of school, and the first thing he did was he spent a, several months reading. He read everything he could read, and then he took his GED and passed two weeks before the high school class graduated. Mm -hmm. And then he um, got a job in a gas station. And the gas station job led to pumping gas, led to repairing cars, which led to repairing machine tools, which led to his going to AT&T Bell Labs and repairing some stuff there. And he met a guy there who was kind of impressed with him, a guy named Stephen Shu. And Stephen Shu said, you know, you should be, you should be going to school. And so they, they, he suggested that my, my brother-in-law um, go to a county college because he didn't have much money. So he did, and he got, he got a, a, an associate degree in physics, went back to Stephen Chu, who said, now you go to Rutgers. And so he went to Rutgers, graduated second in his class, went back to Stephen Chu and said, what do I do now? And Stephen Chu said, I think Fermilabs is the place for you. <laughs> So this he guy's was moving up, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he went to Fermi Labs, and then he went back to Stephen Chu, who had a master's degree, and <clears throat> Stephen Chu said, I think I can give you a job. And so he worked with Stephen Chu, and he, among other things, you know, as part of the team, uh, co-authored a paper that um, uh, won Stephen Chu the Nobel Prize. So my ex-wife's brother, who had been <laughs> retarded in the fourth grade, co-authored a paper that won a Nobel Prize. Why did he win the Nobel Prize? Well, you, the, the prize goes to the, to the head of the team, really. Okay. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's quite an honor to co-author this, you know, this kind of thing. I would imagine. So um, he eventually realized <coughs> that since he knew about machine tools and so forth, he could, he could manufacture products that would be used by people like Stephen Chu, who also went on to be the head of the um, Department of Energy in the United States for a number of years. And um, so he started an organization called Thor Labs, which m manufactures laser equipment, the hardware that you use on a laser bench. Mm -hmm. And he has, I, last I heard, he had about 100 employees, this kid who wasn't going to make it. <laughs> and. Um, 
Yeah, sometimes people <laughs> screw up big time. But the point is, I asked him at one, t at one point, so what are you doing down there at, at Bell Labs, AT&T Bell Labs? And he said, well, we take lasers and we point them together so that the waves from the lasers interact with each other to produce areas where no waves actually go. Uh -huh. And if we can capture, and it requires being very close to absolute zero, if we can capture um, sodium atoms in there, they will, they will go, they'll drop down and then they'll hit light coming in from different sources and they'll bounce up again. And they, they, just, they just hang in there. Gravity isn't enough to pull them down. <laughs> It's in a vacuum. And so he said, I said, well, what do you do with that? He said, well, then we shut the lasers off and watch the sodium <laughs> atoms bounce. And I said, <clears throat> I said, that is the most useless thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> and he said, you don't understand. And in fact, I didn't. He said, if we can do that with a couple hundred sodium atoms now, yeah. in 10 years, we might be able to do it with a couple of million hydrogen atoms. And if we can do it now with $40,000 lasers, in, a, in 10 years we may be able to do it with 50 cent diode lasers that come from Radio Shack. And if we can do it now at a cost of millions of dollars, in 10 years we may be able to do it at a cost that's very, very low. Mm -hmm. And he said, with, with luck, and there's no guarantee that this could happen, and you've got to remember he was talking about this 20 years ago, he said, with luck, and there's no guarantee that this can happen, 20 years from now, you might be able to go down to the hardware store and plop $1,000 down on, a, on, the, on, the, on the bench and say, I want one of those, and get something that fits into the socket that your, your, um, your um, electric meter goes in and okay. pour in a pint of water and be powered for the next 10,000 years. <laughs> you know? And the fact is... Well, that it, is what these guys really are working on. That's right. It hasn't happened Yeah, yeah. with that. Yeah. But th the fact that it doesn't happen with that... You know, you look at these, at these, uh, these examples. Let's just say that you've got a 1 in 10,000 chance of saving the world. So worth should, trying. Should, you, should you do it? Well, it's, it's worth, worth trying. trying, you know? <laughs> And, and if you've got a 1 in 10,000 chance of saving the world and you're one of 100,000 organizations that are doing that, you are probably not going to save the world. But 10 people, but 10 already, organizations yeah. probably yeah. will. So there, there are real reasons to, to put into, the, into the, the science. And there's a lot of hope for what comes out of that science too. Remember, uh, transistors. Oh, yeah. Transistors? What, what in the world do you want transistors for? <laughs> semiconductors? What's a semiconductor for? What is a semiconductor? I, I asked that question when I was in college. What's a semiconductor? Well, under certain circumstances it conducts, and under the, in other circumstances it doesn't. And I say, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? Well, the point is, if you've got a semiconductor that you can turn on and off easily, and you've got a transistor, uh, you can build laptop computers. Mm -hmm. It just takes a little time to get there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why people do uh, research. And there's an enormous amount of research that's I got some done. interesting pictures about this. Oh, good. On the left is this Lawrence Livermore situation. That is the laser laboratory that they're working on. That looks like something's out of a Buck Rogers And film. that's where they did what they just wrote about. Yeah. On the right is the alternative way of producing fusion power. Okay. That's called a tokamak. A tokamak. And this is a huge building. And okay. if you see in there, these, I, I'm trying to put a marker on it. Yeah, you can see the these. green things that looks like the eyes of the, of the insect in the middle. The, <laughs> yeah, one, they one look, is, look like, one this is, dark is green, where one is light green. this is where the fusion reaction is supposed to take place, and it happens at such a high temperature and such a high pressure that they can't contain it by any material made. Yeah, uh, anything we could put it in is going to melt. It's going to melt. So, it's going to so vaporize. Vaporize. It might so turn they're, into so they're confining this stuff with huge magnets, which yeah. is why this is so large. Yeah, and they haven't come to a point yet where. Energy out equals energy. Well, maybe in that yet. thing that, that we've got at Lawrence Livermore there is, in fact, the kind of thing that my, my brother in law was doing. 
It's much more like it. Yeah, yeah it really is. It's very much like... The uh, business of aiming lasers at each other and trapping things and, and bobbing them. But this tokamak, is, it, is it, they're still working on that. As a matter yes, of fact, they're they building a very large facility as we speak. I'll okay. see if I can... I can I'm pulling the wrong uh, <laughs> mouse here. Oh, okay. This is over, I believe, in France. Okay. Now, this picture is about two years old, so it may be finished already. But okay. they're building a tokamak right here, which and will be the first uh, attempt to commercially my produce. My goodness gracious, look at that. That's a lot. That's a very large place, That's isn't a it? big place for a tokamak. <laughs> I don't even know where it's going to be, but I, I, I suspect that we're... we're Is a tokamak bigger than a bread box? <laughs> bigger than a very large bread box. I think it's going to go, be built... I think they're building it, the entity right there. If you look real close over here, there's a yeah. tremendous transmission line go, going Oh my in. goodness, yes, I see it. Tremendous transmission line. Yep. So this is what the uh, fusion energy is looking at. And since we're talking anecdotally here, I won't get into what a, a tokamak is, but back in the early 70s, I lived near Princeton, New Jersey. Yeah. And one of my friends who lived in the apartment complex for me worked for a nuclear fusion in Princeton a scientific, a privately owned scientific lab. And he was working on nuclear fusion. We're talking, like I say, 1970. Yeah. And I said, when are we going to have nuclear fusion? He says, oh, not for at least 20 years. This is 1970 now. And I said, well, what if we had a Manhattan Project, you know, and funded this thing? Could we do it in 10? And he says, not possible. He says, there are certain things... One thing has to happen before the next, yeah. and more money isn't going to make it happen faster. Yes. And he says, we'll be lucky if we see it in 50 years. Okay. And that was in 1970. Well. So 50 years is coming up. Yeah. Let's see if it happens. So we might. <laughs> we might. We might. Yeah. Now, back to you. Back to back me. Back to you, Chet. Okay. Um, from an organization called Value Walk, although this could have come from Tom Fennell, who knows all about it. Tesla has managed to bring down f battery prices per kilowatt hour by half in the last four years. Yep. I, I heard that earlier today. <laughs> I did mention exactly that. Yeah, you did. Yep, I did mention exactly uh, that. With plans to halve the cost again when its Gigafactory comes online in 2020, as electric cars become affordable, demand should produce even more economies of scale. <clears throat> this is going to have a profound influence on energy in the United States for a bunch of reasons. One, because the cars themselves can store grid electricity. So, so the question they of, themselves are part of the grid. Part of the grid. And, and this, is a, this is a really good deal for, for consumers because on a smart grid, the, um, the cars can be charged at the lowest grid rates. They will accept they will know. They'll be smart. Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll say, they'll... I want to take power for charging when the cost of electricity is, is low. All and then, by computer. When the, when the grid needs, needs power, it says to the car, cars through the smart grid, we could use some of that power back now, and the, and the cars sell it back to the grid mm -hmm. at a somewhat mm -hmm. higher price. And this means that even though you depend on your own home, for fueling your car, you may actually make out. You might be, yeah, you might be able to sell some of that power. <clears throat> and you might, you might have no fuel costs. Absolutely. It's possible, yeah. it's conceivable. On top of that, you've got the second big advantage of this, and that is those batteries will probably last five, six, seven, eight years. You've mentioned this one. And this is when, something we don't even think about. When they are uh, too old for cars. Mm -hmm. They've only used a, uh, somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of their life value if they're grid tied. So as they become ineligible for automobiles because because of their age, they're still eligible for grid storage. So they can be sold as used batteries yeah. to electric yeah. companies or sold as or used bat batteries to people and used to back up the grid. And, you know, I did a rough calculation of what I expect this to produce, and I'm expecting that by 2025, we're going to be adding batteries to the grid at a rate that will add a backup power for the entire nation that will run into a, day, a day's worth of power or more per decade, which means that in the course of a decade, 
Now we've got a day's backup. And with a day's backup, that means all that power from sun and wind, it is no longer intermittent. It is mm -hmm. absolutely it's, reliable. It's totally saved. Yeah. You use it when you need it. You use it when you need it. And, and adding, adding to it after that, you're just going to get uh, more icing on the cake. And so the, and there, there are other reasons why intermittent power is not really all that intermittent. Yeah. But I think that's, this, is a, this is a valuable thing. Again, from Tesla. Because, why can they finance this? Because they're giving up their patents. <laughs> Which makes their battery building facility. Did we, did we talk facility. enough about that, or are we confusing it with last Monday? On I the think we may show. be talking about last Monday because last week when we did this, we didn't know that Tesla was going to be giving its patents away. No, we didn't. That, yeah. that happened over so the weekend. So this is new. Te Tesla, and we, you know, we reported this earlier today. Tesla is giving up its its uh, patents, so anybody can use them as long as they're using them reliably. And you know, part of the part of the part of what was said there is so important. Elon Musk has made it clear that as far as he's concerned, it is less important that Tesla make money than it is that the world survive. And from the point Isn't of... Isn't that a crazy point What of a crazy way to think, you know? <laughs> I mean, honest to goodness, you'd think the most important thing would be Tesla. Heck with the rest of the world, you know, as long as they, we, can, we can live in a world that ends as long as after the end we're still going and rich. Yeah, yeah. What kind yeah. of thing? But this is the thinking of, of um, a lot of people. As long as you're on Elon Musk, he made news again today. Oh, yes. Just this morning. Well, I got it from your, your yes, blog. Yes, well. <laughs> He's going to build a huge solar panel plant in New York. Yes. Who Actually, knew? he's not going to build it. He's going to, he's going to be involved in extending it. The plant is already there, I think. Yes. Pro announced plans to expand its production to 1,000 megawatts a year. Okay. In one of all oh, this. Oh, okay. He's got one running in California. Yeah. I think the one in New York is Oh, new. that's a new factory. Interesting. I think that, yeah. Interesting. Okay. I had, I had assumed something that maybe I shouldn't have. A rise in demand would push the company to build significantly larger plants as the cost of solar power continues to significantly fall. Wow. We expect that demand will dramatically increase as the demand for the solar in the U.S. and in all parts of the world. Yep. Absolutely. Now you talk about Chinese, talk about the U.S. and uh, I, I came across news that I did not convey at my blog today about Africa, and there was a lot about Africa where, you know, the the overwhelming majority of the people in most of the African countries don't have any electricity, and that exactly. means you know they've got no social life. They've got the kids can't study at night unless they're studying next to a kerosene lamp, and just the simplest forms of electricity. I think back to my childhood when I, you know, I, I, the, the house that I, that we had in New Hampshire that, that was lighted by electric lights hanging, one bulb in a room <laughs> from the, from the middle of the ceiling and the, the, uh, the, the light bulbs were clear glass and I remember the, the brightness of that filament just making my eyes hurt. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just just the smallest amount of electricity can make a huge difference, huge difference, because the kids can study at night, because you don't have yeah, kerosene fumes absolutely. in the house, and and things of that nature. And the cost of doing that has got to the point where, in India and Africa particularly, where there's a need for this. And India is really leading the way. India is way ahead doing yeah. exactly this. They've announced trying to get a solar panel provided it, electricity system for virtually every Everybody. mud hut yeah. in, 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 in three years. In yeah. three years. They, they have a third have of their population is without electricity. Two light bulbs and a television set. Yeah, and my, I told that to my daughter and she was horrified at the idea <laughs> that people would be given the television set because it was obviously that the government wanted to control people's minds. She's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> much as I hate to say it. But, you know, this is uh, the cost of progress sometimes is that your mind is controlled. But it's interesting because India recognizes that. In Africa, they haven't even figured that out yet. Yep. Uh, I think we have to move on. We've got several items to get and only about t seven minutes to get them in because we well, started well, a little... We're, we're talking no, too we're much. about ten minutes to get it in. <laughs> okay. The, at the International Off-Grid Renewable Energy Conference and Exposition in Manila, 
cool. Yeah. I Large international way. agencies and financial organizations showing off are showing support for off-grid renewable systems that can offer viable, striking, swift change to remote communities in Africa. Okay. Uh, that from Clean Technica. And this one is good too. The local dot no, no being being like dot com, but it's Norway. Oh, okay. The new leader of the Nor of Norway's Labour Party has called for the country to become the world's first zero em zero emission nation, at an unexpectedly radical speech that signaled a sharp change in the party's climate policy. A zero emission nation. Yep. In a country that's rich in oil. They want to sell that oil, but they want to... They want they're going to sell it to somebody else. They're going to sell it to somebody else. <laughs> and okay. honestly, I think that they're hoping to abandon that at some point uh -huh. because they don't want to have a country, a, 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 a world that is, that is changing because yeah. of their products. Yeah. But if they can get off the need for power and, and uh, uh, make their own electricity renewably, then you know, it'll, it'll probably be better for them than than the oil has been. Besides, mm -hmm. they've got so much money from the oil now. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've got a trillion dollars banked up, for, banked up for the from the oil almost. Do they really like yeah. a sovereign fund? They have a sovereign fund. It's yeah. the largest sovereign fund in the world. Wow. Yep. Okay. Um, now, yesterday on the nineteenth, the energy uh, companies generated the lion's share of the world greenhouse gas emissions, about forty percent of the total. But they will also suffer global warming, uh, as global warming picks up pace, as the generators from nuclear reactors to coal-fired power plants feel the brunt of weather changes. This is from The Guardian. And what's happening here is, and you've mentioned this, <clears throat> thermal plants and the, and the fossil fuel plants and nuclear plants are almost all thermal plants. Mm -hmm. The thermal plants are all located by water. In, in places where they have water. Yep. And where is that? There are 10 nuclear reactors in the United States that are just on the Atlantic seaboard. 10% mm -hmm. of our nuclear right reactors on the Atlantic are seaboard. on the Atlantic seaboard. Many of our reactors are, are I, almost 100%. I know of one reactor that is not actually on a lake, the sea, mm -hmm. or a river. They actually produced a reservoir right at the plant so mm -hmm. that they could, they could have it there. <clears throat> And that plant is in a, is in, in a semi-arid uh, area, and you know, which means that the the plant could be basically, for from practical purposes, stopped from functioning by a drought. And guess what? They've got a drought. Um, the The rest of the plants in the United States are all, except for the ones that are actually on the sea, they're all susceptible to flooding. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, this and is... And the ones on the sea are susceptible to hurricanes. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, this is just the, this is just the nuclear plants. Those nuclear towers that you see that are huge. Um, they're the cooling towers. They're the cooling towers, and coal-fired plants have the same kinds of They have the same towers. Yeah. Yep. Okay, now, yesterday, the 18th, from the... Um, Oh, this is also yesterday. That item was from yesterday. This from oilprice.com. Chinese President Xi Jinping says that his government is drawing up new criteria for reforming energy consumption and production and will move faster to modernize its outdated en energy regulations. And I just realized, as I mentioned that, I know I, s I pronounced that name wrong. And He won't care. I might have cursed him by accident. <laughs> I don't know. But, yeah, he probably wouldn't care. He'd, he'd understand. But, you know, here again, we, we, we're seeing the, the Chinese government <coughs> saying that it has to do more. But this leads into the following item that comes from France, in, uh, from Reuters. France is set to unveil a much-delayed energy transition bill on Wednesday which was yesterday, that will uh, avoid taking ch tough choices on its dominant nuclear energy sector, and instead focusing on measures to cut red, red tape on renewables. Well, in fact, that policy was unveiled, and we read about it today. It's not in the list that I had here. I should have replaced that with the one that was today. But 
Today what they said was they are going to reduce, and this is really kind of expected, they're going to reduce their dependence on nuclear power from 75 percent to 50 percent. Well, that's and, a big departure for France. That is, and they're going to increase their dependence on renewable power from 15 percent to 40 percent. Makes sense. So that's what they're talking about doing, and you know, I, I really think they can save a lot of money doing that. Now, today's news. Um, this being the 19th, despite being quite a gray country, we think about about uh, red and blue states. Mm -hmm. This is a gray country <laughs> <laughs> with average solar irradiation levels worse than even the U.S. Northwest and Alaska. And by the way, gang, that is worse than Vermont. Germany's um, is the Germany is the world's solar power leader. In the last couple of weeks, it broke three records at one point getting 50.6% of its demand from solar PVs. Well, the interesting point about that is it's grassroots. Oh, it's yeah. It's coming from the bottom up. Yeah, isn't that fun? This is because people are putting solar up on their roofs, on their garages, in their backyards. It's because farmers are putting solar up on their farms. They're mm -hmm. also putting up wind. This is mm -hmm. just solar. Um, it's because small businesses are putting solar on their roofs. and. That accounts for probably 75% of the solar that goes in mm -hmm. because the utilities are only accounting for about 5% of it. And a, f a fair amount of it comes from big companies that are doing it to cut their utility bills, um, which means now is probably not a good time to invest in German utilities. Good point. <laughs> I, I'll have to call my broker to say <laughs> Right. Absolutely. Let's all do that. And finally, this is our final item for today, which is a good thing because we're almost done with our time. Four former heads of the U.S. EPA who served under Republican presidents. This is just the that ones one serving under Republican that, presidents. That, that one I've got. Wednesday stop, uh, urged lawmakers to stop bickering over whether climate change was real and start finding solutions. So the sad. Republican Party, which is institutionalized in the idea that global warming is a fraud brought about by socialists to take <laughs> over the world, have got to admit, according to the people who are advising them on environmental policies, that it isn't a fraud. It's yeah. very real and it's causing a lot of damage. And every time I read something like this, and this has come up in the past, I think to myself, you know, sooner or later people are going to start understanding that the leadership of the Republican Party has been lying to them. And yeah. I, I cannot imagine that that's going to do anything but really damage that party. Which is a well, shame think, because not everything yeah. that it believes in is wrong. Yeah, yeah. But it does mean that it, you know, they, they are becoming the untrustworthy party when it comes to global warming. They are in denial. Uh, well, it's, it's an article of faith. It's an article of faith, that's right. They quote a guy here, Senator Ron Barrasso from Wyoming. Thousands of people will lose their jobs. Okay. He added, describing measures as all pain and little gain toward reducing global temperature. And then the response is it's, that it's scare tactics. Barrasso and his fellow senators on a bipartisan committee spent the entire first hour of the first two and a half hour hearing making their own opening statements in which they debated the legitimacy of climate science and traded warnings over the cost of acting versus the cost of not acting. Senator Barbara Boxer, now she's taken the other hand, mm -hmm. the other hand a Democrat from California, said she has been called a job killer for years. <laughs> and each, each time she has supported an initiative to make way for a cleaner environment. These scare tactics, this is quoting her now, they have been tried before and they are just not real, said Boxer. She's the chair of the committee. The four former EPA administrators who testified at the hearing, including, these are the guys, these are the Republicans who turned around and said, hey guys, wake up, global warming is real. Mm -hmm. These are the four Republican guys, served under Nixon, Reagan, and both Bushes. Yep. As a group, the quartet penned an op-ed in New York Times last year that said there was no longer any credible debate over whether humans were causing climate change. At the hearing, this one that just happened, they reiterated this stance and said stricter pollution limits mean job creation 
is likely in fields of renewables, nuclear, clean coal, it says clean gold, but it's clean coal, and natural gas. They also urged lawmakers to put aside their differences. And like I said, it's, it's an article of faith. Yeah. It's not science. It's politics. Yeah, we have to say goodbye to people who are going to be, who are watching this on, on um, Cablecast because we've actually run over our article. Our well, hour. we started a couple of seconds late. So. Oh, we started late. Okay. <laughs> goodbye, everybody. But for those goodbye. who are watching on, on, uh, I on the get computer, uh, let's. Uh, bye. Bye. Let's. <laughs> hello. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you were, you were just talking about. Um, Four EPA people. This, this of course, being the the additional material for whatever whatever comes of it um, from Energy Week. Well, pretty much we're over on that article. But um, but I think but I there's think, other other things that you brought up that I got some pictures of. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. The next one is came up today. Okay. Is about the offshore development in Massachusetts. Oh yes. And big I place. Think, uh, this is as big this, as Cape This is Wind. going to be interesting to local people. Yep. Massachusetts to open an area the size of Rhode Island to offshore wind power, okay, potentially doubling U.S. offshore wind capacity. Okay, this is bigger than Cape And there's a map of it right there. Not that you can see how what the scale is, unless you not, happen not to see... Not very well. Uh, you, you can notice that Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket are there in the there, upper part. That's, that's real life. That's real yeah. scale. And, if you and this is are 12 from, miles away at the minimum. Yeah, which means that you could be able to see them on, on really good, clear days. Pretty, would, pretty much. I co I'll cover that. Yeah. We're talking 70, 742,000 acres, which would make it about the size of Rhode Island. Yeah. They're going to auction the space off to different developers, it would nearly double the federal offshore acreage available for large wind energy projects. Well, this is the, uh, this is the camel's nose in a tent, because this has got to grow all oh, the Oh, yes, down absolutely. The Atlantic Seaboard. Yes, board. absolutely. And, you know, the, the, amount of, the amount of offshore wind capacity that the United States has is sufficient. It's enormous. It's enormous. It's sufficient to provide us with 100% of our We have a, a very power. shallow continental shelf. On the East Coast. On the East Coast. So and we can Gulf. go out many, many miles and develop yep. this. And it's not bothering anybody. Well, it's, you know, it's, there it's are not people. not anybody's backyard. There are people who are opposing wind who will say that it's bothering birds that are, who, are, who are migrating. And I will tell you that, in my opinion, having looked at their arguments and the, and the counter arguments, the people who are complaining are wrong. Not 100% wrong, but about 99% wrong, uh -huh. which is why the uh, Audubon Society of Massachusetts and this, the Audubon Society, Maine Audubon Society have both they've kind of turned around. supported mm -hmm. Cape Wind because of a couple of different things, one of which is that these big offshore shore turbines are typically situated half a mile or more apart. And that gives the birds who are migrating a lot of space that they can migrate through. And radar images have shown that those birds migrate between they, the rows. They rose. can see these things. They, they can, they see can them. detect them somewhere. They, or they don't. They don't want to get involved yeah. in, in wind turbines, so they go between the rows. Yeah. And um, another thing, of course, is that the number of birds that are killed by wind turbines has been estimated by various agencies over and over and over again. The one that I can c carry in my mind is the m material that comes from Canada, which did not actually look at the number of birds killed by wind turbines versus the number of birds poisoned to death by fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. But the one in the United States compar compared those two. I should say compared deaths from wind turbines with deaths from fossil fuels, which would be more than just poisoning. But they um, concluded that the that the wind turbines are far less likely on a per megawatt hour basis. Uh, they're, they're, they, they will kill a few birds, but only about, about um, one thirtieth of the number that are killed by fossil fuels per unit of energy created. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing, you said we've got a, a broad continental shelf, which is great mm -hmm. if you want to an anchor the wind turbine on the, on the, on the bottom, on of, the bottom the of the ocean. But various organizations are, are putting together um, floating 
wind turbines. Mm -hmm. The Japanese are very interested mm -hmm. in this because they don't have a continental mm -hmm. shelf. And if they're going to get offshore wind, they have to get it from what are, in essence, uh, ships. Yeah. And of course, those ships, the technology, Islands, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> those those ships are a technology that was developed for offshore uh, drilling. drilling. Yep. So, you know, that we've got that benefit from the offshore drilling industry where uh, we can get wind turbines that are offshore. And as you pointed out, I think in the last um, show, the the or maybe it was the radio broadcast, but the technology for for putting in submarine cables is old. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you can you know you could you could position something a hundred miles offshore if you wanted to. Absolutely. And and bring it in. Absolutely. So and and there, there is there is a kicker there though. There's not very many American companies left that can make these submarine cables. <laughs> well, you know, there's one in the East Coast, one in the West Coast. Really. And they're full up doing communication cables. So if you're going to build power cables, you're going to have to buy them from Europe. Well, Which is, there's nothing wrong with that, except that European companies are owned by Europeans. Well, yeah, some of them are owned by Europeans, some of them are owned by Arabs, and some of them are owned yeah. by Chinese, and some of them are owned by Americans. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's but, politics more, more than reality. It, yes, I think that's true. And Americans who can manufacture these cables will if they see a market for it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Or at least if they see a, a market that can make them money. But I, I do remember working on the uh, what they called it the convex crossing between Long Island Lighting and Connecticut Light and Power. Okay. Across the Long Island and Sound. Across Long Island Sound. And our company was a big bidder. And we wound up losing to Pirelli. Okay. And uh, the remark was the Italian joke is on us. Pirelli being an Italian company, yeah. they took our... They, you know, took they, it, they did it by having a cheaper cable. Yeah. It was basically the same cable, but they were able to make it cheaper. Interesting. When was that? Late 60s. Uh-huh. And the, the problem there with us was capacity. We couldn't, we could make it, but it was, it was longer than our normal capacity to make power cables. So for okay. the Hudson River, that was duck soup. But for the five mile or ten mile convex crossing, it was stretching our abilities. How far was the crossing? About ten miles. Ten miles. Yeah. That's about the width of Green Bay, in off you know Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, that's. Um, I I paid attention to that because because of um, um, the fa I was I was tracking the the uh, Pestigo Fire. Uh, Got a little, little, little picture here that I'll bring up, and it shows the uh, line of sights. Let me. It, it depicts how far away a turbine can be while you're still able to see it from land. And it's okay. about 12 miles. Okay, well, this was the distance that we were talking about exactly. off the coast of, of Massachusetts. The edge of the area, and they're talking about what we just mentioned, would be 12 miles off from Martha's Vineyard and 13 miles off Nantucket. But turbines wouldn't be erected there, only farther off the zone, which is significantly farther away than anyone can see because of the curvature of the earth. And that's what's described in that picture there. Right. They did say that uh, if they, some of the closest turbines might be visible under special atmospheric conditions, but they'd be very small. Well, this is, you know, when I, when I lived in New Hampshire, I lived on a, on a mountaintop, and I became very well aware of what it was like to live on a mountaintop. And, you know, I would wake up in the middle of the night because of noise from a... Yeah, from a, uh, a train or something in the yeah, valley. Yeah, a diesel locomotive that was 10 miles away. Yeah, yeah. So when people complain about the sound of wind turbines, I can say, yeah, I understand yeah, what that's yeah. all about. But um, the... the uh, um, the distance that I could see, the farthest in living in New Hampshire, the farthest mountain I could see that we we were able to figure out was we believe a mountain in Connecticut. So we were seeing all the way across uh, Massachusetts. And but you were seeing mountaintops from a mountaintop. That's right. Yeah. Which is a, you know this is a, this is like yeah. like in that picture, it's seeing the top of a ship from the top of a yeah. lighthouse. Yeah. 
Um, I, my guess is that probably three days out of four, we could not see that mountain because of atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. And it was probably normal for atmospheric conditions to cut off our view at 10 or 12 miles. Um, things get, you know, the slightest amount of haze will, will, will shut things down after that. And it will also change the, thing, the color of everything to blue a lot mm, of the time. Mm, mm. And, you know, I, I, remember, <laughs> I remember writing a, a letter to, to a friend of mine who said it must be beautiful up there with, with uh, trees changing color. And I wrote her a letter saying, uh, you know, really, I can see what's close up, but so can everybody else. You don't, need a, you don't need a big view to see trees changing color. And if they're more than a couple miles away, you can't see the color anyway except blue. And I wrote, wrote the letter and put it in the mail. And the next day I got up, looked out the window, and sure enough, I could see a mountain in Massachusetts called Sugarloaf, which was... Um, probably about 10 miles away, looking very orange. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh, cool. So, you know, everything I say is uh, probably not true. Got another one to talk about here. It's actually two related items. It's about st storage of nuclear fuel, and uh, et cetera. This particular one, the first one I'll bring up, has to do with depleted uranium. Oh, yes. And uh, that's an interesting one. This came from your blog, yep. and of course it says that the company wants to triple the capacity of a burial site that accepts waste from dozens of states. And this is lo what they call low-level nuclear waste. Yeah, I believe we send our waste there. From Vermont, we are here. part of the compact that yeah. is allowed to use that dump. But it's not high-level. The high-level no, waste like all stays in No, it's like gloves that are contaminated yeah. with... Old wrenches that fell into some yeah. of Yeah, and know. on the right is a picture of that storage space, that storage, and that's right. large. That's yes, very you, you, you can sort of see that crane there in the picture is a very large crane. And on the left, they're just experimenting with uh, depleted uranium. Right. They've run it out of Iraqis to, ship, to, to fire oh it at, so uh, they, got, they figure they got to do something with it. And they're shipping it there in casks. And this is experimental, so it doesn't, as they say here, handling more dangerous material that wasn't part of the original license. Now, we should point out, depleted uranium <clears throat> is the uranium, when, when you start out with uranium ore and you refine it, you get to uranium that's... To make a fuel. To make fuel. That uranium that you get is 99.4% or something, U-238. And U-238 does not sustain a nuclear reaction by itself. Mm -hmm. You have to enrich it so that you have more than six-tenths of a percent of U-235, which is what the rest of it is. And um, that's what those uh, centrifuges that are used do. And mm -hmm. the, the, the process of doing this is almost like mag magic. You, you make a, a, a compound which is uranium and fluorine, and you it, make a gas out of it. You make it into a gas. And, you know, spin the gas. When I think about uranium <laughs> being part of a gas, it just strikes me as bizarre. Yeah. But yep. you spin it, and that separates it, and you can get the, the concentration of U-235 up to above 3%, which is required for nuclear fission. Or you can take it up higher. You can take it up to 15% or 20% or 50% if you want to build nasty devices. And... Um, the, the depleted uranium is uranium that is absolutely not um, useful as a fuel. Can't blow up. In a, in a uh, nuclear plant that depends on critical mass. Now, last week we were talking about, yeah. about, yep. re about reactors that would use that mm -hmm. as fuel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I said the waste at Vermont Yankee could keep us going for 400 mm -hmm. years, and Steve Rucroft said, George, you haven't calculated that right. It's, lo it's longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, we did not take depleted uranium into account. At all. At all. And that depleted uranium could be used... <clears throat> And it's a very large percentage. You know, if you think about going from six tenths of a percent to three percent, you realize that eighty percent of what you're doing is just, is depleted uranium, and it's going to be put in a dump in this case. And that eighty percent could be used as fuel, mm -hmm. and that would extend the amount of if you use that, it would extend the the amount of uranium that was actually processed for the for making power for 
Vermont Yankee, for, for example, you can, you can consider if there's a thousand tons of, of spent fuel there, there's about 4,000 tons of depleted uranium that was processed and is now under storage someplace and only used for just incredibly nasty bullets. Yeah, um, basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, the the, uh, um, the uh, amount of power that you could get out of that, that, if you combine that all together, would keep the state of Vermont 100% powered for forever, a couple of thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> and we haven't even got into the thorium that's in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't, you know, the, the nuclear power that we've got right now that depends on critical mass, I think, is inconceivably foolish. Now, there's a lot better ways of doing things than the way we're doing it. Uh, yeah, I would say that. But at the time we did it, there was a purpose behind it, and it was basically nuclear-powered naval vessels. Yeah. We needed them, we wanted them, and yeah. we developed and, the And technology. actually, you know, I've, I've been interested in, in history all my life, and military history is part of that. And there was a point in my life when I read a lot of books on the Second World War. You know, for example, Samuel Elliott Morrison wrote a history of U.S. Navy operations that went into seven volumes. And mm. I read them. Did you really? Seven volumes. <laughs> no, I left out one volume, which is a history of submarine warfare, because that just sounded like the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. But nevertheless, I read six of the seven volumes. And one of the points that was made, and it really, it really was easy to understand about naval warfare and nuclear power, the submarine, I mean, the, the aircraft carrier WASP failed to attend the Battle of Coral Sea, was it the Wasp? I think it was the Wasp. I might be wrong about that, but mm. one of the one of the of the aircraft carriers failed to be there because it was refueling. Mm -hmm. And you cannot refuel in a, under combat situation. You have to withdraw from the area, refuel, and come back again. And that meant that a third of the time that it was at sea had to be withdrawing, coming back, refueling, doing things. Makes of that a lot nature. of sense. And so, by having a nuclear plant, you can you can increase the value of an aircraft carrier immeasurably. Because it does not have to go back for doesn't fuel. doesn't have to go back for fuel. And so, that was a very important thing. It's important for nuclear submarines because they can stay underwater. Mm -hmm. And because they have a, a power plant of that type, they can make their own oxygen. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, which means that they can stay underwater for months. Mm -hmm. And so, there was, as you said, a reason why they wanted nuclear reactors. Well, we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think what we have to do, and you know, if you think about it, the people who are, who are in the nuclear industry, the, the engineers, the researchers, and so forth, if they could develop a, if they could build a nuclear reactor that did not involve critical mass, that could not melt down, especially if it cannot produce uh, long-term nuclear waste, which Stephen Rucroft was telling us was possible, and seeing the, how the technology works, I find it very easy to believe that it's possible. It um, certainly sounded possible to me after yeah. hearing him talking about it. Yeah. Um, the people who are afraid of losing their jobs, the people who are afraid of losing their investments, with the exception of the investments in the actual nuclear power plants that exist, really are, would probably be better off. If they, if they had that future, if they could have a future that got rid of nuclear waste by consuming nu nuclear waste, then if they just denied that this was well, possible. To use an overworked word, it's more sustainable. Yes, it is, it is much more sustainable. Mm. And in fact, I think it's vital when you consider we have to get rid of that waste. There's got to be a way to get rid of that waste. That's... Brings me right up to the next one. Okay, let's see the next one. <laughs> a good segue. This is the article, and it's talking about what the nuclear power plants are going to do to hold their spent fuel, ah. and what are they doing, and what they plan on doing. And it segues into, uh, well, it talks about Yucca Mountain, and the fact that that's going nowhere. So the utility is trying to figure out what the heck to do. Yes. And we've got 
our casks sitting there waiting for somebody to figure out what to do with them. Yes. Down there in Connecticut, uh, which one is this? Which one is what? The, the picture here coming up. Oh, okay. It's in Connecticut. It's, it's down near New York City. It's in Connecticut. Yeah. And they are building their own structure to store the casks there. Okay. And these are, it looks like they're... It's Millstone their, is the name of the Millstone. Place. Yeah. Millstone. It looks like they're cast, storing their casks on, the so, on their sides. Exactly. Okay. Yep. This is what they're, they're... This is in the process of being built. It's partly being built. And we're, the pictures here show them loading some of these casks, which are uh, metalized casks. They're right. not concrete like ours because yep. they're going to be storing them in concrete. Okay. So you can kind of see the picture there. They load them up, they push them into that hole in the uh, wall here. And okay. when they're finished, they're going to have, well, you can see what's over there on the right is what, what they're building. The huge buildings to store these things. This, this, you know, it really bothers me with the nuclear power um, because what we're doing is we're taking a mortgage on, on the future. In order to get power now, we are mortgaging the future. It's going to be there until they figure out what to do with it. It's yeah. going to be there for all intents and purposes forever. Yeah, unless we have something to do with it. they got to figure out something to do Which with it. Which is why we were talking about the... Um, the um, the power amplifier. Uh, energy amplifier. Energy last amplifier. Week. Yeah, and I just realized that my microphone was off, so... Off me, that is. Not but this so. is what they're planning to do down in Connecticut, and okay. uh, it's a short-term solution to a big-time problem. A very long-time problem. And if you think about this as a problem that will last for, to pick a number, 100,000 years, although that Try is... just the word forever. Yeah. If you think about it as being 100,000 years, and you think about the casks being good for 100 years, well, that means that we've got a solution to one-tenth of one percent of the problem. <laughs> and the rest That's of it is going to fall hell. on a bunch of That's people who are going to be there for a period that is many times as long as the length of human history. So th it just seems monumentally um, irresponsible, I think, is the, is the best word. And, you know, one of the and things... And the only reason we can't really deal with it appears to be political. It's money, but it's political more yeah. than anything else. Yeah, and and in the past, uh, Tom, I had told people we are in an in a in a, a generation that I think people in the future will call cursed, mm -hmm. or will curse because mm -hmm. of the damage that we've done. Mm -hmm. But I think right now we're at a point where we are going to be um, moving into a time which people will call blessed. And the reason for that is because we've got a problem and there are people among us who know that it's a problem. It's not just one problem, it's, it's really an approach to life. Um, how do you get rid of nuclear waste? How do you get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? How do you provide for the poor? You know, mm -hmm. is is part of this very it's, big it's, problem. It's all part, of, it's really all the same problem. It's all part of the same problem. It's, it's how you live on this planet. It is a matter of sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we've talked about General Motors saying that they, they had to change the way they were doing business. Mm -hmm. They had to change the way they were manufacturing the cars, and they had to change the nature of the cars that they were manufacturing because the automo automotive industry is not sustainable. And Elon Musk, uh, who is basically ha three weeks after General Motors made that statement, <laughs> showed up and said, oh, by the way, I've got a bunch of patents, and you can use them. You don't have to even reference me. And that, by the way, is something you cannot back out of. You, no, this is a no. deal you cannot, yeah, yeah. because there are issues with patent law. Uh -huh. He has officially, I believe, maybe I'm wrong, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but as I understand patent law, and by, I should also mention I have worked on several hundred patents, um, my understanding is that once you've said something like that, it's over. Well, the patent has you've no value. You've got to also figure that it goes beyond him just making a statement. Yes. The guys in the background that do this kind of stuff yes. dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's I think that's before true. he said a word. Yeah, I'm sure that he vetted <laughs> this idea yeah. pretty fast. Yeah. But, you know, he, he's a brilliant man. Absolutely. And he, he has a goal in mind here. 
And he, he made it clear that it's more important that the world survive than it is that Tesla make money. And so he wants, to, uh, he, he wants that goal to be attained. And I think um, there's a part of me that says that's just PR because he's got a way to make money out of this. He's got a, he's got a big leg up on building the biggest battery factory in the world. Mm -hmm. And he's realized that there is a point here where the hardware, the batteries, are the thing of value. And the software, the patents, the computer software, and so forth, are a secondary issue. And by making that, that secondary issue easily accessible to anybody who's got a lot of money and wants to put it into manufacturing cars, He's going to be the person who who gives them the batteries to put yeah, in. He's still going to make out, of and he's going to make out. Yeah. But when you say I've got a patent and I'm abandoning it, it's if the, once that's on record, it's it's very difficult to undo it. And my guess is that it would be absolutely impossible. I would argue the point. So I think this is a this is an important issue, and the 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 overriding issue here that I'm that I'm working on here is General Motors, which benefits from Tesla's decision, <clears throat> which Tesla made public after General, General Motors <laughs> said that they needed it, or that they you know, indicated that they had use of it. Um, Tesla could have said, you can't do this without my, without my patents, and General Motors would have had to pay for it mm. if they wanted to use the patents. But of course, patents, you change the location of the screw, as you said earlier, and, mm. and maybe the patent has been, you know, I could tell you stories about patents. I'm sure you could. Um, <laughs> a, a beautiful story about a patent was the, the one on the, on, the, um, on the safety pin. A guy, I don't think I know that one. A guy invented the safety pin, and he went around and he went to pin manufacturers, and he, he said, I want, you to, I want you to make these things and pay me royalties. And my recollection was that there were eight big pin manufacturers in the United States, and seven, seven of them said, gee, that's great. And the other one said, not interested. And the one that said not interested started manufacturing safety pins. Uh -huh. So the guy who, who had the patent went to them and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get money from you. I'm going to sue you. And rather than go into a lawsuit, the company simply gave him a bunch of photographs of um, artifacts from, a, from a, an Egyptian... Um, tomb, uh -huh. one of which happened to be a safety pin. Uh -huh. And they said, basically, we're not copying your patent, we're copying that ancient <laughs> artifact. <laughs> so his response to this was to ignore them and let everybody else assume that they were paying him royalties mm -hmm. as well and continue <laughs> to pay him royalties on, on an invention that somebody had made 4,000 years earlier. Amazing. But um, you know, the, the business of a patent is not valuable unless you can defend it. Mm -hmm. And a patent has no value unless somebody's willing to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a patents are, they're not, a, they're not a guarantee of, you know. And this is a, I'm, I, I come from a family that has lots of patents. My father had patents. My yeah, older brother has that. many patents. I have patents. My one of my younger brothers has patents. I have a daughter with patents. I have a son with patents. You know, it's blah 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 blah. And um, it's a couple of these patents have proved valuable, and most of them have not. Yeah. But um, nevertheless, and of course, the ones that I have have not. What can I say? <laughs> Nevertheless, I think, I think what we're doing is we're coming to a point where industries are starting to look at sustainability as an issue that they can benefit from considering. I got a couple of other interesting things I'd like to cover. Okay. Gibraltar. Oh, yes, Gibraltar. They uh, are going to be experimenting with a wave power alternative energy kind of project. Cool. And is this I the one that looks like a snake? No. Oh, it's okay. not. This is a different one. There's a okay. lot of different approaches to wave power, there, and, there sure and I are. can't really make out from this picture what's going on. Yeah. Uh, uniquely shaped buoys to capture and convert wave energy into low-cost electricity. The floaters will be specifically designed in accordance with a particular wave climate, and the system will have built-in storm protection. <laughs> and shockwave protection yes, mechanisms. Well. And they are talking about a future expansion up to a full 5 megawatt plant, which doesn't sound like a 
heck of a lot. It doesn't sound like a lot, but Gibraltar, but Gibraltar is not Gibraltar's demand big. is 15 megawatts. So <laughs> yeah. just this one plant will give them a third of what they need. Right. And now the next one is something that's close to both of our uh, thoughts, I think, because we've talked about it quite a few times. Wrong. Oh, wrong good. Mouse. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, this this is a well. It's I've combined two different articles here, yes. both involving the Genbacher. Explain what the Genbacher is. Well, it's here. actually Yenbacher. You're right. Yeah. It's <laughs> the Germans. My Anglo-speaking tongue is right. twisted. Yeah. Um, the Yenbacher is an interesting company, and it dates back for centuries. And they've made all kinds of things, from pots and pans to these things. And um, after the Second World War, they didn't have anything to do, so they started making um, uh, engines for locomotives. <clears throat> and if that engine looks like it belongs in a locomotive, that's why. It they probably make, does. It's it's a it's a locomotive engine that's been adapted into a into a generator set and of course those big diesel locomotives don't they don't the, they don't drive the wheels they don't drive the wheels they drive they drive generators generator, which, right so they're doing the same damn thing <laughs> yeah but it means that you could any wheel that's on the track you could apply power to yeah and um that is a much better system than trying to dr draw the train from a from a big wheels on a steam engine in terms of traction um but these big engines, uh, what, they, what they did was they started to realize that you know, the market for diesel locomotives was declining, but the market for electric generators was increasing. So they switched. And the Yenbacher engines, like this J920 that you're seeing here, um, are designed to sit in a place and generate electricity. And they are, I, I forget the, 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 the um, Name that they have for these. It's a, it's a, it's a trademark. It's something. Yeah, like, GE's got a trademark for it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, flex, a real Madison Avenue trademark. Yeah, it's flex yeah. drive or some, flex <laughs> fuel or something. This, like this that. particular article is about landfill gas. Okay, okay. but but the but point they also is, use natural gas. Yeah, or, any one of these engines, which is designed for gas, can be adapted for just about any gas. I and, think without too much. Modification, they can make it run off of uh, hemp oil or something like that. Yeah, they probably They're basically could. diesels. Yeah, and they, they're basically diesels, although as you pointed out, they had spark plugs. Yeah, and, and I found sure. out there's a reason for that. D you found out what it was? Yeah, yeah. There's a term in diesel technology called the cetane rating. Okay. And even a word is archaic, but it has to do with the ability of that fuel to self-ignite under pressure. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, the higher the cetane rating, the easier it is for diesel, the diesel pressure to turn it into, to, to explode it. Okay, let me guess. Gases have low C10 rating. Correct. Aha. Uh -huh. uh -huh. You see, exactly. I'm smart after exactly. all. Exactly. <laughs> uh, matter of fact, it's interesting because veggie oil has one of the highest cetane ratings. It's higher than diesel fuel. Really? Yeah. Isn't that fun? It has seems to have to do with the viscosity or the thickness of the oil. I can't imagine or the why. Imagine, you know. Anyway, what happens with these things is that Yenbacher, which is a, an Austrian company, was bought by General Electric, and um, and they had this J920, which they marketed in Europe but they had not been marketing them in the United States. The J920, they've been marketing the Correct. other engines. Correct, and, it has, and much of it has to do with the electrical, electrical difference, 50 cycles versus, versus 60. 60. Yeah. And, and that just seems like a very easy um, uh, Technically, it's te easy to technical problem to me, but they were not- They weren't geared up to do it. Geared up to do this. Jen, Yenbacher is not all that big a company. But they have been supplying increasing numbers of these engines, and they have competition from organizations like Siemens. Yeah, Siemens is making one, and I think Mitsubishi's making one. Probably. Yeah. It's hard, hard to imagine Mitsubishi not making one. Here's a but picture they, of a couple plants. Uh, yeah, here um, you go. The one on the left is real. It's in France. Okay. It's not the one, it, it, it only has six engines. And Which, they're talking about one with 10 engines. Okay, so now these engines are putting out about a little less than 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 um, 10 megawatts each, mm -hmm. and they are about twice as big as the largest that Yenbacher was selling in the United States before they decided to market these in the U.S. 
So, I mean, if we wanted engines uh, from Yenbacher in Brattleboro, I would probably recommend against this model, even though it would provide us with 100% of our power need, because um, it's, you, you ha you've got a choice of on or off. Well, you, the engines can be stacked, though. Yeah, you and that's the engines. point. They all have, all have to be running at once. That's right. And if you, we, if we you got... You want more, you push a button and the yeah. other one comes on. And if we wanted 10 <laughs> megawatts, we could say, okay, we're going to get... We're going to get four two and a half megawatt yeah. engines. And if we only want to run one, that's what that's we run. Exactly. And because they are internal combustion reciprocating machines, they can be turned on at a moment's notice much, much faster than uh, natural gas. I think this article said five minutes. Yeah. And even the even the the, the peaking natural gas peaking plants, which are extremely expensive, um, uh, take longer. More than five minutes. And they cost more. That's another point too. These engines cost less than a dollar a kilowatt. Believe it or not. That's pretty cheap. It is. And they will run on landfill gas. They will run on biogas. We could run a, a pretty effective um, uh, plant of this type and have it be renewable mm -hmm. in Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. If we didn't try to it super scale it. If we didn't try to to do a hundred percent of our electricity, but really only wanted to get ten percent or twenty percent, this might be a really well, interesting solution. They're scalable. You, you they put are in scalable. one with four, four generators. Yep. You add another generator. That's right. You, you put another biogas generator right. or something like that. If we put in a it. lot of solar in in Brattleboro. And then we had a few of these things. The solar could we take could care of our... We could be energy independent. Yeah, well, the solar could take care of our, our, in, our demands during the daytime. And these things could take care of our demands at night and, and step in to produce whatever power is needed uh, in, on cloudy days in the winter or whatever. It doesn't say it here. It mentions it here because in this particular development, it was tied in with a district heating scheme. Oh, yes. They and can do that. That, the, that the efficiency of the total yeah. was somewhere around ninety. Yeah, that's unreal. Yeah, when you I read get ninety percent of that, when I read <laughs> that these engines were forty-eight and a half percent efficient without district heating, yeah. if just as as I thought, how do you get forty-eight percent plus out of a reciprocating engine? Yeah, that is an un, unreal. Well, uh, one efficiency thing I rate. noticed reading it, they got double <clears throat> tur turbochargers. Well, you know, these, these guys have not cut corners in design no. to get that kind of efficiency. No, not at all. And, and this is an interesting thing. As I said, uh, uh, they're, they're sm Yenbacher's smallest diesel engines, I, as I recall, are about a third of a, of, a, of a megawatt. And their largest prior to this in the United States was about four and a half. Mm -hmm. And these things are about nine and a half. And as you said, you can, you can stack them up. You can have a bunch of them running next to each other. And when I said less than a dollar a kilowatt hour, I should point out that's for the larger engines installed by non-union personnel or what have you. I mean, this is the cheapest you're going to get them in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. But they are, they are uh, a very, very interesting. But it looks, looks pretty clean. It, uh, <laughs> well, biogas coming out of these things should be cleaner than natural gas, yeah. and the natural gas is going to be, if you're running natural gas, it would be about as clean as, as, as it would be. You can make these things be very clean. They are not diesel engines. They're super diesel engines. They're kind of a hybrid. They are, yeah. And with a district heating, if you're, if you're, um, if you're doing district heating, that would, that would provide a lot, and one of the things that, that drew me into this uh, was looking into di district heating and, and interest in that. But as I, as I reviewed district heating, I thought, you know, in terms of Brattleboro, if we were to put a couple of these things at the landfill, mm -hmm. the old landfill, we'd have to put in long pipes to get to downtown. And I don't know how effective they would be in terms of district heating in term, and the cost of getting those pipes in. They do it lo over longer distances than that in Europe right now. I don't even think Yeah, about I know. It. They don't. But w we, would have to, we would have to justify, for example, the town or utility or whatever putting those pipes well, in. Basically, downtown, the merchants would have to buy into it. They would have it to. It would have to yeah. be a downtown heating project. On the other hand, sense. yeah, on the other hand, if you had 
something that was closer to downtown, um, it, it would be easier to justify the, um, the heating system. Um, there was the Brattleboro Thermal Utility, mm -hmm. and I forget the name of the other one. There were two of them. Yeah, they, were, they, they merged eventually. Yeah, and they, they had, did just marvelous work on trying to uh, get Brattleboro to be um, energy, uh, less energy dependent than we had been. And, you know, thinking about this downtown versus West Brattleboro and, and Putney Road and, and, and you know, a spread out town, South Main Street, things like that, where do you put district heating? Um, it, it was clear to me that district heating is probably not going to reach West Brattleboro at a reasonable price. You'd have to dig the Not from up. downtown. But, but you could put one of these things out there. Yes, you could. And, and it doesn't have to be big. It could no. be a third of a megawatt, and exactly. that's, that's not a huge amount of power. But the, the interesting thing is, for those people who could not be on the district heating system, if you've got a good source of electricity, they can use heat pumps. Mm -hmm. And the heat pumps have got a high enough efficiency that they're probably going to get as much benefit out, out of it as they would, be, would have on, on a district heating system. So if we were to do this kind of thing, I would look at district heating very carefully. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't throw it out, but I wouldn't say demand it either. No, I think that's a good good approach because there's probably some areas like downtown where it could make a lot of sense. You need to have some kind of density. But you're never going to come to the point where you're providing heat for every little town, house in Brattleboro. Except it's never going to happen. Except either. if you've got heat pumps in those houses and they can take the. Well, extra. yeah, the, so, I was thinking thermal heat. But yeah. Yes, well, uh, the the thing that I find really kind of beautiful about this is. If you consider the amount of woodland that we have in Brattleboro, and uh, not in Brattleboro, and but across in the river. Wind Wyndham County and across the river, there's a lot of woods around here. Absolutely. And we could, we could be 100% energy independent on the basis of our woods, I think. That, that group of people who came down from the, from the state mm -hmm. the last winter, was it last winter? Late winter, early spring? Maybe. At the River Garden. Um, at the River Garden. Yep. Yeah. They they basically said that we had we had that. We've got the ability. We've got the ability in every sense except the fact that the the lot sizes tend to be small. Uh -huh. But um, I think that you know if you think about waste wood, I think about a, an ice storm that hit the area of Albany, New York, a couple decades back, and they had something like fifty thousand tons of wood, and they didn't know what to do with it. So they had to dump 50,000 tons of wood. Where did they dump it? I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, I think, they, I think literally they, they trucked it to Lake Erie and or put it under water or something, which is fine <laughs> if you're sequestering carbon. But, you know, you, you, if you think about 50,000 tons of wood and what do you do with it? What do you do with for, forest falls? What do you do with the falls from an ice storm? You truck them away. And I think that at a point it might become irresponsible to do that and not use them for biomass. So I would advocate having a biomass plant being at least investigated. I'm not going to argue the point. I'm, I'm thinking along those same, line, yeah. same lines. I think it but, makes a lot of sense. And, and the biomass could be put into any, any situation that takes, and it doesn't have to be from wood. It could be agricultural biomass, it could yeah. be... Uh, you don't have to burn wood to boil water anymore. There's that's right. better ways that's to do That's right. It. And as a matter of fact... And this is one of them. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're at a point, too, where we're, we're going to start thinking in terms of digesting the wood, yeah. using the wood for fertilizer yeah. and for, for methane to burn. We're, we're in a different age now. We've got choices that we never had in the past. Well, good way of looking at it. So... Anyway, what else have we got? Well, I, this is interesting only because of its size. <laughs> Let me pull it up here. Kyocera is going to build a 430 megawatt solar power project in Japan. 430 it's, megawatts. It's going to be on an island. It's, it envisions <laughs> using a combined... all of Japan is on an island. <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. A, a combined land area of roughly 1,600 acres. And they, they try to give you a, an idea of how you can visualize that. I the can, equivalent I can visualize. of 134 professional baseball stadiums. Yeah, well, you know, I think of 1,600 uh, acres as being 10 standard 
um, land grant farms in, in Illinois. Yeah, okay. If you look at Illinois farms, they're almost all multiples of 160 acres because yep. the original farms were 160 acres. And that, this is 10 you of got those. Four, you could get four of them in a family, couldn't you? Four what? Four farms. Four, four I, land I don't know, but yeah. four farms was a square mile. Yeah, yeah. And so this 1,600 acres is also two and a half square miles. So it's a mile by two and a half miles. That's not huge, and but it's uh, a lot. I, I highlighted this one. I thought it was interesting. In this project, the solar modules would be constructed on stilts, allowing Good. the land to be concurrently utilized for both power generation and agriculture. Yes, and they're doing that in, in the UK as well. And you know what I've been thinking about? Because I've been interested in aquaponics. We had a show yeah. on aquaponics. You could put up solar panels and have fish tanks under them. Sure. So you could do, <laughs> which would make it a little bit easier to deal with, uh, with cutting the grass because there wouldn't be any grass under them. But you could have fish tanks under them and in the areas between them where you have easy access to, to uh, um, equipment, you could grow plants that you could use to feed people and to feed fish. And, oh, yeah. yeah. And get a, a very healthy sized agricultural yield out of a out of a piece of property that is growing lettuce and and beans and things like that and in addition to that fish and in addition to that solar power and it There's sounds like all sorts of pretty, ways to combine these things that yeah, make a lot of sense that is a pretty intensive you know, one of the things about about uh, power that people you know people have objected to in terms of renewable power especially solar is that it's, it uses a lot of land. And it happens that when you look at it closely, you find that solar power does not use more land than coal because the coal has a tendency to destroy the land that it's taken from. That's a good way of looking at it. And, um, but at the same time, the big land use is, is agriculture. Yeah. And, and if you can combine this, you can combine wind and agriculture fairly easily. I, very well. But very if you well. Can I've combine, got a picture coming up that does exactly that. If you can combine solar, solar and agriculture, you've got a, you've got a pretty good... And it can uh, be done. It's, it, yeah. it's just not rocket science. So let me pull this one up. And I, I, oh, I saved this particular picture only because if you will look at the... This is in Kazakhstan. Okay. And obviously, those are some sort of agricultural fields. Yes. But what's interesting is the uh, turbines themselves, or more particularly the supports, call them the pylons or whatever. Yes. They're lattice work. Yes. The old ones in the United States were too. Yeah, but we don't do that anymore because the birds like to build their nests in the lattice work. Isn't that mean of us not to let the birds build their nests? <laughs> <laughs> but the birds used to get chopped too flying in and out of their nests. Well, you don't want the birds building their nest in your uh, chopper. In your chopper, that's right. <laughs> Germany's energy uh, re revolution moving ahead. And yeah, here's the, the tokamaks. Uh, let's see what other pictures I've got here. i got a lot of text, but not... Not a lot of pictures. I think I'm running out of pictures. Uh, we have we actually run out of pictures? I've run out of pictures. At least in this in this batch. Okay. Now, that I, I you know to go back to the tokamaks, I really kind of wonder where that's going. It it may take another ten years for it to be. It's going to take more than ten. You think so? I think it's going to take more than ten. It'll be interesting to see what happens. They have this. not. I mean, they're building this plant, but as far as I know, they have not come up with a continuous way of getting more power out than they're putting in. Yes. So it's still a science project. Yes. A damn little, damn big science project. And, and yes. ultimately, it might wind up being the way to generate electricity. But that's a... It's going to be in the future. That's way in the future. One of the things that's important about this, and I think that it's important to think of in terms of the energy amplifier and things like that, too, I, I see a big reason for an energy amplifier. And that big reason is because we need to get rid of the fossil fuels. Absolutely. The, not the Absolutely. Fossil fuels, if, the if for waste. no other reason, that makes sense. Yeah. But it solves a big, long-lasting problem that right. nobody's really thinking about. Right. They're just kicking it down the, can, down the right. road. Right. 
Um, the, and, and for that reason, I would advocate that kind of nuclear power. Mm -hmm. The nuclear power that uses waste but does not produce it. Mm -hmm. um, and cannot be used to build bombs and, and, and cannot have the kinds of accidents that we've had at Chernobyl and Fukushima. But the fact is, as I look at this stuff more and more, what, what I'm seeing more and more of is that we are in fact at a turning point where we are developing, we have already developed all of the technology that we need to run the world sustainably. Mm -hmm. And all we've got to do to stop global warming and, and climate change and things of that nature and stop our electric bills from going up and up and up as peak oil becomes more and more dear. There, you know, there was an article about, um, did we talk about it last week? The, the, the um, oil co companies have said that they've, they've got shale oil that they can pull out, but it's not, it's not worthwhile doing it at below, at below $120, $120 yeah. a barrel. Yeah. And that means that the price of gasoline would go up by a dollar a gallon. Yeah. And the price of home heating oil would go up by a dollar yep. a gallon. And that means that our bills for, for fuel would go up 25%. Not going to save us any money. No. But we've got the ability to, to get past that and deal with, um, with renewable power, with sustainable power. And, you know, the, the, but what I'm seeing is this convergence of technologies. We're, we are at a point where we can, get, we can get solar power very cheaply. And if we can't do anything else with, it, with solar power, we can do it, use it to heat water. You, you have a, a series <laughs> of oil drums in your basement that have been cleaned up, and you, not oil drums, but drums in your basement. Yeah that have been cleaned up and you're storing water in them and you've got heaters in there that li just like the heaters in, in, um, in uh, uh, your heating tank, electric heating tank, and whatever excess power is you know, from your solar, you just put into those things and heat them up. We're at a point where the amount of power that you would generate out of that, the amount of heat that you would generate out of that, is in excess probably of what you would need to heat your house because of changes in the technology of house insulation and ceiling. And you know, th this, these things are converging where the price, of, the price of power from renewables is going down to, the, to below the price f from fossil fuels and nuclear. The, the need for power is, is also declining. So what are, we, what are we waiting for, really? The need for power declining is another biggie. Yeah. We are learning more and more and implementing more and more ways to save energy. Right. This is, you know, the business of the house that doesn't need a lot of power. I mean, 20 We've, years ago, that was that 20 was years ago, laughable. the idea of, of, of lighting a house with LEDs was yeah. laughable. Yeah. The idea of heating a house with a resistance heating floor mat in a bathroom, that's all you use to heat the house, <laughs> um, is, was R60? laughable. 60 Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, really. Who's going to use R60? It's too expensive. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things this architect I was talking to in Brooklyn, he's got six units in an apartment building. Yeah, you mentioned him. Who, th their heat is a floor mat in the bathroom. And he said it's really great to walk into the bathroom in the morning. Because, it's you know, warm. it's warm. The feet, <laughs> your, your little feet get all toasty. You step out of the shower and your feet are warm. And, um, but that's what's needed to heat the house. And you know the uh, fellow the, um, that who I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Bob Irving was telling me that you can get ninety percent of the way to having a zero energy house with at no expense if yeah. you're building a new you house. Mentioned that in this conversation. So, what are our choices? You know, why would we why would we buy into the idea of needing a furnace when we when it's it's the same price to have no because furnace? Because we've always done it that. Because way. we've always done it that way. Yeah, there you go. Why don't you put the camera on yourself? You always put it on me. My hair is all messed up. I think people should see your hair. Being Hello messed there. Up. You're, you haven't got it to you yet. <laughs> you got to click on it again. See? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. There you go. <laughs> and you're advertising the commons. We should talk about the commons. We talk about Green Energy Times. Yeah, yeah it's we good should paper. talk about the commons. It's a good paper. Well, my first job in life was a newspaper boy, and it looks like it's going to be my last one. <laughs> <laughs>
my first job in life was working in a farm. Uh huh. Yeah. The Hollow Hill Farm in New Jersey, which belonged to a woman who was worth a lot of money. Well, I got a couple of things here. Don't have any pictures, but they came out of your blog, so. Uh, Let's talk about them. We'll, we'll hit got, a couple of them. We, we probably got another five minutes anyway. Well, this one says Japan to revive nuclear power reactors. Yes. It's a new regime in Japan, a new administration. And uh, after Fukushima, of course, nuclear power is verboten, but now they're talking about re-embracing it. Well, they've been, they've been working on this for a couple of years. This new regime is, I think, about a year and a half old. And um, they, yeah, they want to go back to nuclear power. Not entirely. No, not entirely, but they had, had once decided they're, they're going to scrap it all. Yeah. And, and these people want to reopen about somewhere between a third and two thirds of the nuclear reactors that were shut down. I didn't think it was even that much. Yeah, I don't think they're going to go to two thirds, but they've got a bunch of reactors they do not want to reopen. And some of the things that they've been arguing about are really, I have to consider them strange. Like one of the plants, the question was the fault under one of the reactors, was it or was it not an active fault? And it, the, what it boiled down to was it, it depends on what the definition of active fault is. <laughs> now, this fault, this fault was in the ground directly under the reactor. Well, it depends on what the definition of is is. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's another one uh, that's, in, that's critical really now because it's very big in the news. Russia shuts off natural gas shipments to Ukraine. Yeah, we should mention, by the way, that this has happened before. Well, Ukraine hasn't paid for the gas. That's right. This is the reason why they have shut off the gas is because the Ukraine has not paid for it. But there's a problem there because if they uh, shot it off to Ukraine, the gas still goes through Ukraine. Yes. And the Ukrainians can poach. Well, not only that. In this case, the Germans don't get the gas they're paying for. It. Yeah. <laughs> not only that, but it means that the Europeans are developing more and more reasons not to do business with Russia which means that they're developing more and more reasons not to buy natural gas at all. Yeah. And they are developing more and more technology and understanding of how to avoid buying natural gas. Mm -hmm. So do the Germans need natural gas? This is a question that you can bet the German government is asking You better believe they're thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. And because and I think they of know this, the answer already. I think they do, yes. 50% in one at one time of their energy from solar. Now, I got to point out that at the time they did that, they were probably getting 20% of their energy from wind. Mm -hmm. So, did they do they need natural gas? Probably not. Certainly not in the long term. They can they can wean away from that. They can wean away from I'm it. I'm sure they're using it because it's convenient. Well, the, the, another thing is they're taking their excess power and turning it into hydrogen and putting the hydrogen into the natural gas lines in order yeah. to use instead of natural gas. And that is something that will increase. They are doing bio re gas, uh, biomass reactors, which are generating methane, which is also being cleaned and put into the natural putting gas line. The gas they line. really are developing the technology to get off gas altogether, mm -hmm. and they're developing it very, very fast. Now here's another one else. Australian grid, aging, inefficient, and unprepared. Yes, well. <laughs> yeah. The country faces significant economic and environmental risks due to its aging, inefficient, and unprepared electricity sector. By the end of the decade, in less than six years, almost half of our coal fired coal-fired power stations will be over 40 years old and up for retirement or replacement. Which, by the way, in the United States, the average life of We're coal, in the same situation. Our, our plants, on average, are 42 already. Yeah. So it can take 10 years to plan and build a power infrastructure, so we need to make the right decisions now for the future. Right. That's although, what they're saying yeah. in Australia. Although, I will point out that you can get a solar plant or a wind plant through planning and built in a matter of about three years. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. a wind plant? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, they're, they're at a point where they They're doing a lot less than that. Yeah. I mean, what they're, they're building as we speak, the solar project up on Putney Road. That's right. And it'll be, it'll be completely built in a couple of months. Yeah. And it wasn't even approved until... Less than two years. Yeah. It's a the very, whole, it's whole a very fast even thing. even two years old. It's a very fast thing. Wind and solar both. 
Now here's one you already mentioned, Solar Centuries, which was the name of a company. They inked the first community solar deal. They're going to build a two and a half megawatt solar farm, which has brought together investments from around 500 people. Mm -hmm. So they're reaching broad yeah. to fund the project and to be located at a brownfield site at a restored gravel pit. So they're not hurting anything at all. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, as I think about it, you just mentioned that all of those mountaintops that were removed in places like West Virginia for the purpose of mm -hmm. mining coal are, are... They're horrible looking places. They're horrible looking places and the, and the habitat destruction is incredible. But they could be, they could be um, used to, to build wind or solar installations and with an improvement to the environment in the process. No question or doubt about it. The roads are there already. The roads are there. It's just a matter of, of uh, landscaping it. It's a matter of landscaping it. And how many birds will benefit from landscaping if, uh, and installation of wind turbines? If you're landscaping along with the installation of wind turbines, those birds are going to benefit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, uh, again on a solar deal, there's, there's an interesting codicil to this. Once it's completed, the project will, the, the project, once it has completed the project, it, meaning Solar Century, will seed the site with file flowers <laughs> and locate a number of beehives by the solar Yes, panels. I remember reading that. And it there was also one said thing. that sheep will be brought onto the site in the autumn to graze the grass between yes, the Yes, isn't panels. that beautiful? <laughs> yeah, we're going to have wildflowers and bees. And then when the wildflowers have died back and the bees are no longer making honey, the sheep will go in and trim the grass for us. This, this, is, a, this is an again, interesting it's one. it's a matter of, what's that? Well, you finish what you're saying. No, I, it's just a matter of multiple uses well, this, to this, agriculture. This sort of ties in with something that we said. Yeah. Fight over renewable energy continues in a GOP primary. Oh, yes. Groups that are pushing for an end to the state's renewable energy standards are continuing their efforts in the Republican primary on August 5th. However, and this is the one that gets me, the Political Action Committee of the Kansas Chamber of Commerce, the state's leading business lobbying group, has helped recruit candidates to run against these GOP members who voted against repealing the state law that requires the uh, utilities to generate a certain amount. And this, this follows the Chamber of Commerce's um, policy nationwide. The National Cha U.S. Chamber of Commerce wants to repeal all of these pro-renewable laws. But these guys are against it. The ones that they're, the ones These that, guys are, are... The one, no, the Kansas Chamber of Commerce is trying to, is trying to recruit people to run against those members of the Republican Party who voted against repealing support for nuclear... Is, oh, okay, I read it wrong. Of the okay, I read it wrong. Anti, Voted against repeal. Yeah, yeah, too many negatives. Uh, too many negatives. <laughs> the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You're absolutely right. And what, what is going to happen is that is going to suddenly change at some point in the future because the people in the Chamber of Commerce are going to discover that they have got pressure coming to them from the uh, banking industry and from the insurance industry and from a from bunch manufacturing. of... From Who manufacturing. From manufacturing. And th these people are going to be coming to them and saying, I'm, I'm sorry, climate change costs more than, than you yep. people have calculated. And they're going to have to rethink that. There was another article, and I, don't, I didn't copy it, that said exactly that. The yeah. costs of climate change yeah. are very real. We are at, I think, the end of our second hour, Tom. Well, we have 12.07. Yep, I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We so, interrupted it for a little while. We right? interrupted it for a little we're while. About, we, we're about done. I'm, I'm about the, out that of stuff the, here. You know, that's in, since November we've been going, and that was the first time we really had to break a program <laughs> and ask Roland to do some editing. Yeah, I think, we, I think we covered everything I've got here. Well, in that case, I think we should say goodbye to everybody well, and say thank you for having the patience to get through another hour of uh, George Harvey. What do you know? We're both up on Tom a screen. We're going to put now. You can say goodbye, and then I will say goodbye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> and goodbye, everybody. Very good. See you next week.